creating cosmos out of chaos. I'm going to Kenya, though. Wow, wow. Kenya. And what's in Kenya for you? Yeah. Um, a friend of mine does retreats. We're actually going to be collaborating, doing retreats together next year. But she's her retreats I go to. And mm-hmm. they're just really gentle and spiritual and really beautiful, connecting to self. And like, it, yeah, they're really, really special. And she does them in different places, luxury properties all over. So Mallorca, Idra, which is the island in Greece that has no cars. It's just donkeys. Mm. That was really magical. We did that last September. Wow. And then this year she's going to Kenya. And it was it, it was a just divinely guided um, mm. journey. It wasn't on her radar, but she met someone and he was like, you have to come to Kenya. You have to <laughs> like, I have this property. It's called Olapangi. It's like a hundred acres. Wow. And they have like, there's wild elephants that walk by and giraffes. And I, I can't even, I'm like short circuiting. I'm so excited. Wow. So. And how long is the retreat that you're going for? Uh, it's 10 days. 10 days. Oh, my gosh. It's yeah. incredible. We've actually yeah. always, so always always wanted to go to, to Africa. Africa. Never um, had the chance yet. Well, but. We, had a, we had a friend. Well, I guess somebody did our yoga reach out and offer to bring us to Kenya with her. I guess it was like a, a what is it called? When, like a Christian organization that mm-hmm. goes and helps people. Um, but they yeah. loved what we did and they, they work with a tribe, like one of the last remaining tribes of Kenya that was protecting um, the last rhinoceros on top of a mountain. And it was this tribe wow. of people that, I don't know, you maybe you've seen it on online. They do like the jumping and they jump really high and like it's their celebration dance and it's just this springing. Mm. Get, like, like, and so she sent us all these videos and all this stuff. And then I think we were planning on going. We and were then, actually considering and then, it. And then COVID and then hit. Literally right? like a month before, uh, after, you know, COVID hit. And then we knew like everything's going to start shutting down. So we, mm-hmm. we canceled yeah. that trip and then never really revisited Again, yeah. well, then Xavier was born, and then Kenya. you know, yeah. uh, you know, with like, the little baby yeah. going to Kenya, and that yeah. with the tribes wasn't really in the right alignment <laughs> for right now. Maybe, Didn't feel right in your yeah. heart, you know. But when he's yeah. older, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. But um, yes, oh my god! And how how old is he now? He's two years two? and three months, actually. Tomorrow, mm-hmm. yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, he's wild. one little joy. He's in a, I put him like in this wild school here in Nosara right now while we're here. It's like this outdoor Waldorf type of daycare oh. school. Yeah, mm-hmm. and it's his first time really in a daycare environment because he's always just been mm-hmm. with adults, with nannies or with us, right? Adults are his people. Yeah, it's and crazy. so it was um, an adjustment for him, but That's it's really so good. Sweet. It's really good for him. So he's there right now. Uh, he goes for in the mornings till the afternoon. Oh my God, we got this video of all of the, because he was really, really shy at first, obviously, yeah. because all the mm-hmm. kids, most of the kids are older than him. And then so mm-hmm. they're all like, you know, three, four, five, and he's, you know, he's two and he's the little guy and he's new and he's not used to being around that many kids. Well, there's only like seven or eight of them, but they sent us this video and it was just him in the back of a wagon, like, cause he's got this funny blonde hair and he was just like sitting in the back of the wagon like this. And it was like all the kids like in a parade pulling him, like one in the tricycle oh. at the front and two people oh. pulling the wagon and two in tricycles behind. <laughs> and it was like a weird little parade going around yeah. the jungle. It was actually in the jungle. It's in the jungle. It's just a bunch of little yurts that they put <laughs> in the jungle and the kids play uh. in the yurts. And then, I mean, it's like, has a little cute gate, so it's safe. And, and the second I saw that yeah. video, I'm like, He's in the right place. The right place for Xavier. That's yeah. so beautiful. And that think, is yeah. amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think that that's the really nice thing about, um, you know, uh, we came back to Nosara just for a few weeks to, to work, you know, to shoot classes. and um, mm-hmm. But having the school here as well as for him has been really beneficial. We're not going to be sticking around too long. We're going to take off probably about two weeks. the construction is just so Because like crazy. we said, the construction's a oh. little bit, um, he's yeah. disturbing for us, but. You know, place did get work done. Um, Yeah, and then we'll see where we go from there. But uh, how did you like Barbados? We loved it. Actually, it was nice. It's it's a different vibe, um, in a sense of like when you come to Costa Rica, there's just a lot of there's a lot happening here with you know different cast ceremony in this as you know you've you know it's a very active active place, place with lots of things mm-hmm. which is really fun and a lot of energies there's and so many different energies exactly here. whereas barbados you know it's a caribbean island it was really chill the energy was just very like there was either you know tourists who are there to vacation um or just kind of locals working and kind of living to themselves so it, it was really really quiet and chill for us and at first we were like oh well, we like, hated it at first we felt really uncomfortable yeah, we were just like um, but then yeah like a week two weeks something in, clicked 
we found this sense of peace mm. that I think we were really yeah. needing at that time because yeah. we were coming out of a burnout and just really not in a grounded space. And everything yeah. that was happening in Costa Rica at that time too, there's some, I told you about some crazy stuff here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, some really wild things. And so it was just really, it really shook the base of our, of our sense of grounding and roots, yeah. you know. And so going there and finding that peace and quiet and stillness and you know there's no one really we know so we really just to ourselves mm -hmm. and it was actually what we needed like in the end when we were yeah. leaving we're like we were resisting it at first but then mm -hmm. it yeah. became a really important place to just regain our sense of balance and peace and nurture that for a while until we come back to costa rica because a lot's going on here which is yeah you know, it's good but yeah 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 but how do you because yeah, really, uh, what's that i was gonna say the resistance like there's always medicine in the resistant corners yeah oh my god it's funny mm -hmm. right it's like we find yeah. well i i almost i almost want to be like romanticize the resistance and say it's always what you need when you're resisting but there are sometimes we've been in places where we're like oh no we gotta yeah. get out of here and it's mm -hmm. like it's th yeah. thank god we did but a lot of the times maybe mm -hmm. when it's like an emotional more of an emotional resistance or just like yeah it, it's like the you know we, we always kind of say in yoga it's like the the pose or the asana that you avoid the most tends to be the one that you need the most yes um, yeah and so I don't know, it was so funny because it was just such a different place for us and it was so new and it was so laid back and it just didn't feel right. And then all of a sudden, all of the things that didn't feel right just like gave us such like benefit, like just nourishment. It was, mm. it was really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. But I always think about because, you know, we met each other in Costa Rica and mm -hmm. I, I can't remember if at that time when we connected, you were planning to stay here and make Costa Rica kind of your home or not. Um, yeah, I was going back for winter I, I, and I actually loved it when I met you. I loved it that season. Like I loved it May, June, July. Mm -hmm. And then I was going back for winter, but I had a completely different experience the second time at that, like in the January or December mm -hmm. through. Yeah. 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 That's it. We only used to come to Costa Rica May, June, July. That was mm -hmm. like, we came every year at least for a couple mm -hmm. of weeks it seemed when we met and it was like that was our time because everything yeah. was just like yeah. you get a little bit of rain at night which was always awesome and but everything was yeah. so much more desolate yeah. and just like it was just super like mm -hmm. the energy was just really grounding and that's interesting um, yeah, always, grounded. Yeah, yeah you're looking mm -hmm. for that energy to to what you need in your life and so i'm curious like why why greece kate like what what really drew <laughs> you to greece um, you know, I think that I, I've definitely, ha well, I have astrology, a lot of astrology lines, really good ones mm -hmm. in Europe. Mm -hmm. Do you guys know your, have you had your lines? We done? haven't. We actually were talking we're just, just, just about that yesterday. I really would love to do that oh, yeah. mapping to see, yes. Which line falls in Greece for you? Uh, Athens is my Jupiter and oh. the islands where I do my retreats, uh, the Ionian islands is my Mercury. So communication, oh, interesting. writing and speaking. and um, But I I think that like I had a connection. I backpacked Europe when I was 19 and we did 12 countries in four months and we stayed on one Greek island for a month. <laughs> <laughs> so wow. like 11 countries in three months and one Greek island in a month. And we did a couple Greek islands, but we just stayed on this one. It was the party island back then, but it was, it's called Eos. And it, I just remember we'd like be dancing all night and the beach all day and it'd be the same people you'd see every day, but then new people would come in and, mm. and uh, the 19 year old thing. But, but for me, I just felt so connected to, I remember we stayed at this pension and the family treated us like we were their family and they made mm. us dinner whenever we wanted. And it was just this, the Greek people are so loving and heart centered and it's not the same in Athens. Like they're still loving, but they're, you know, it's a city. Yeah. So it's like, yeah. mm. there's a bit more, you know, subdued energy in the city, but the Greek islands, it's just like, People's hearts are so open mm. and so beautiful and they're so generous and the islands are so magical and every single Greek island is different mm. than the other. Like they all have their own unique magic and there are hundreds of islands. Mm. It's crazy. Yeah. Like every day someone's like, oh, blah, blah, blah island. And I'm like, what? I haven't heard of it. It's <laughs> wild like there's so many and um I, I actually did my first retreat in Italy in Bologna and I had this dream of living in Italy one day since I was very young mm. like since I backpacked Europe actually and I never said Greece but um 
I, through Airbnb, I was just looking for the perfect venue for how many beds and rooms I needed for mm-hmm. my retreat. And I looked everywhere in the Mediterranean and I, I found this one place on Mykonos of all islands. I didn't really know anything about Mykonos at the time. I just was like, oh, Greece. Okay. So I did retreats in Mykonos for a while and kind of got burnt out of doing them in Mykonos because it was like quite out of alignment. The energy of Mykonos just isn't, it's right. not even Greece. It's like fake Greece. Um, <laughs> It's like the Las Vegas of Greece. And so then I um, started doing them in Corfu. My friend, Mariana, who's doing the retreat in Kenya, we did a retreat. uh, Her very first one was in Corfu Mm. at the Corte Estate. I feel like maybe I sent it to you because when you you guys were thinking. Yeah, I remember you showed me that. Beautiful, beautiful place. Yeah, it's stunning. It's so special. And so when I found that place, like I got out of the taxi and looked around and just started crying and I felt the energy of the land. And I was Mm. like, oh, this is where, because my, my immersion that I do with my clients is it's not a retreat. It's like, it's like more like theater school where they're Mm. like breaking, they're, they're learning how to express themselves in new ways and breaking Mm. free from all the limited parts of themselves. And, Mm. and I need, there needs nature and Mykonos, our place was all cement. And anyway, so that's why, how I ended up in Corfu doing retreats and fell in love even more. And then, it happened really divinely. I was supposed to get on an airplane to come to California for a week on my way to Costa Rica for the winter. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, you can't go to the U.S. right now. It's a red, Greece is a red zone. So you can't, unless you're American, you can't fly straight into the U.S. And so I couldn't go. And I was mm-hmm. literally, this is 2021 fall. And they went, and then I just, I was crying and like, but I, I was going to meet my parents because I hadn't seen them in two months. And then I was going to be in Costa Rica for the winter. So mm-hmm. I was going to spend a week with them in California. And they said, I'm sorry, you can't get on the flight. So I went to my friend's place who are from Athens. And my friend, I was looking at flights to Costa Rica and trying to figure out the route. And mm-hmm. and he was like, why don't you just move to Greece? Like you love Europe, you love Greece, you you're, you love Athens. It was my first time really spending time in Athens that mm-hmm. trip. Mm-hmm. Cause usually I'd fly through London and then I just, I loved it so much. And he was like, and I felt something light up in my body and I was like, yeah, okay. But I still wanted to go to Costa Rica for the winter. So I just booked a round trip ticket and it's been like so easy to live here. Really, mm. I even speak. I even speak a lot of Greek, and I have a, apparently a really good Greek accent. <laughs> so people come. I get complimented on my Amazing. Greek accent all the time, <laughs> and I'm not trying. I'm not taking classes or anything, but I do my Pilates classes. Like they have these group performer classes, mm-hmm. and they're in Greek. Mm-hmm. And the teachers, like, if I really look like I'm out of the loop, they'll come. <laughs> and say yeah. But like, I've learned all the colors from Pilates. I've learned how to count to ten from wow. Pilates. My classes all teach me, like the 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 part participants in the class are like oh green is this so like they they teach me during class yeah. so it's become this like really wow. sweet thing and that's yeah. so beautiful how divinely the universe was just like no you have to go here yeah. like you know mm. yes. and it's interesting it's like these kinds of circumstances when they happen like there's this resistance in us it's like no and you get upset and you have you're because you, you have a plan you were like this is what oh, i'm supposed plan. to do yeah. and then the universe has yeah. a different plan for you and it's like yes. until you surrender and open yourself to like okay i'm not meant to go to costa rica yes. in your case yes. right i'm meant to go to yes. greece and look you, you're there yeah you're yeah exactly and this that is my, like my brand is called the unscripted woman. And this is exactly what it's about. And mm-hmm. I'm going to be writing a book probably this, well, hopefully this year, I'm going to at least start it, but, um, well, it's kind of started, but the unscripted woman is like, this is the, I've been coaching for f- over 15 years, but this work I've been doing for seven years and I birthed it myself. My only baby I've ever birthed. Um, mm-hmm. it came through from many years of doing, you know, my own stuff, over, yeah. um, with coaching and all the different places. But, um, but I realized over the years what the work really is, is teaching, like helping women untether from the script Mm -hmm. of who they've been taught to be in every facet. And then it's about like letting life lead. And that's exactly how I live my life. And people are like, what, what do you mean? You're just moving to great. Like what? And that's over here. Actually, I don't think they were too shocked because they're used to it by now, but it's just like, now I'm over there. And it, but it's, it's, it's just following that, following mm-hmm. truth. And it's so funny. People are always like, oh, you're going to stay in Athens forever? And I'm like, what? Like, why? H- how would I know? <laughs> like, I, don't know. <laughs> I don't know my future self. Like, I, who, who maybe, knows? like, yeah. probably not. But but it's it, like that we're so, yeah, attached to controlling and knowing mm-hmm. where we're headed. But 
That's, no, that's, none of us know. That's none such, of us actually know. That's such it's a true. powerful answer to that question. How would I know? Um, and it's something like with our lives that our families and friends have had to get very, very used to. Because they're like, yes. where are you going to be in two months? You know, what's your, or where are you, where are you guys headed next? And it's so, I've realized how funny it is. Like when my father asks us, like at dinner, hey. like he was visiting us in, in Barbados. And he's like, so what's the plan from here? You're, and we're just like, <laughs> well, we think we're going to go to Costa Rica for maybe a week or two. And then what? <laughs> well, I don't know. We'll see. We don't know. And he's just like kind of nods and like, oh, of course. But it's been years of like, if we're two months ahead in planning, that's kind of the, the, the sweet spot. But it's rarely like yeah. upkept at that point. And, and it's led to a really, really serendipitous unraveling of, um, of a life that I think we're really happy with. Which is yeah. like to to yeah. allow the plan to to like to allow your hand that stream of consciousness to write the plan as you're acting it out, and mm -hmm. it becomes yeah. um I don't know it's scary at times, and and the, it, it, I think the 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 hard part is battling a little of the uncertainty. It, yeah, like, of course, you get it a little more with than anything. I. That feeling of like, well, where am I going to be? Or, you know, <laughs> yeah, just, I have that right now. I'm moving. I'm literally this place. I've been in for a year my lease is up and they sold it. I have to move. I was supposed to move into a friend's place temporarily while I found a place and their place has maybe must or mold or something. And so I went there to get, I got the keys and I went there to go check it out. And then I stayed for 10 minutes and I got asthma from there oh and God. I went back the next day, same thing. And I was like, okay, not moving not, there. Not and there. then I had a couple different people suggest things and like, and it's a peak season. So easily my mind can be like, mm. no, you're not going to find anything here. But yeah, it's like, yeah. I, I know it's going to be amazing. Like wherever mm. I am, maybe it'll be on an island. I don't yeah. know. You know, it's like, but that's beautiful. And I think that's such an inspiring thing, you know, especially mm -hmm. like you're saying with your brand, you're, you're, you know, you work with women. And I think in terms of giving women that inspiration and that power to break yeah. away from the old patterns of, well, everything has to be a certain way yes. and it's like let's open yes. our hearts and, and live more in a free perspective of not always yeah. knowing where you're going to be or not always needing to be in a certain place whether that is even you know a physical place in the world or a relationship right like yeah. there's a stigma yeah. that um right now I feel like it's people are learning to be okay with not always having a partner or being in a particular mm -hmm. relationship or you know what I mean? Whereas yes. in like the olden days, like even for me, especially coming from a, you know, a Eastern European background, like I grew up mm -hmm. in a place where as a woman, if you're 21 or 22 and you're not married and you don't have a child, it's like, oh. what's wrong with you? That's so when we well, started yeah. dating, yeah. like My the dad, first time I met like, her father, I think within five minutes, he's like, when will you be having babies? I was 21. <laughs> we're like, like, <laughs> we're just like, what? Oh, he was uh. a future seer. Maybe he's psychic. <laughs> <laughs> but again, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, but my father, you know, I come and from you, that background and that's just like the stigma, yeah. but now it's really wonderful yeah. to see things shifting. And, you know, I think something for people listening right now as well, um, what I admire and the work that you do, Kate, is that, like I said earlier, you're giving and bringing that inspiration to so many people. Mm -hmm. And um, and it's funny because maybe if some people don't know what you do, I think I, I would just wanted to share my first ever um, experience with finding out about you and kind of how we met. But uh, the very first time I heard your name and what you do, I was like, yeah, I met this girl, Kate. She's a love coach. <laughs> And I was like, what's a love coach? I never heard that there was a term called a love coach. Um, but is that an accurate term? It, it, like, have you, is that, or is that just somebody kind of putting it into a box and like, well, how would you explain I mean, what I you think do? I, I, a liberator of women. Ooh. I love that. Yeah. I, I, I don't, I, I change it every time. And there's definitely love coaches, relationship coaches, dating coaches, the mm -hmm. whole gamut now. Um, but mine is, is it's not really about, I'm not attached to whether someone's in a relationship or not. That's not the point. The point is the relationship with themselves because that's the only relationship that's at the core of all mm -hmm. of our relationships. Like that's mm -hmm. at the root of everything is the relationship we have with ourselves and what's happening inside and how we're projecting our pain and our pleasure onto everyone else. So it's, but what, what the work really is, is of the unscripted women is liberating women to break free from who they're taught to be so that they can be who they are. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. And there's a never ending unraveling mm -hmm. of getting to know the magic of our souls and what, Mm -hmm. what life in the universe has in store for us. Yeah. 
And that's so beautiful because I find that, you know, with, with women and maybe a bit more in the older generation. And I refer this a little more to my mom because my mom was married to my dad for, um, 23 years and then they separated, um, for very sad reasons, but, um, for to watch my mom be, you know, her identity was my father, yes. was her yeah. marriage. This is all she knew and all she That's breathed. What she was taught. That's all she was taught. Again, coming from that Eastern European background, you're a woman, you're almost like you're secondary in that culture, right? Like the men are more like high, higher ranked, as I would say, mm -hmm. but it's still true. And you see that even when you go to Ukraine, it's like oh, yeah. when they talk to you, they'll like, w w whenever oh, I yeah. talk to somebody from Ukraine, they'll talk to Mark, but they won't make eye contact with me. There's a few cultures. You know what I mean? There's a few like cultures they... where they actually bring wow. the women from, like down the rank. But to come back to my mom, like when she separated from my dad, she went through a really difficult shift, right? I mean, everything she knew was taken away from her, that identity died but now when you watch her what she's gone through she's began to reclaim herself like you're saying is yes. she's mm. she's got started doing dance classes she got new friends she got a, her own house she's busy all the time she's doing things she started taking care of herself in a different way she lost yeah. weight like you see the person she is now compared to what she was during that whole span with my father and it's like wow, you really see that reclaiming of her own self and her own soul. And that wouldn't have happened for her if that marriage didn't end. And that's just one example. No, but, but it was beautiful to witness mm -hmm. too, because it, was, it wasn't it was easy. And oh I, don't, I, I imagine- I don't think it is easy yeah. for anybody. No, for yeah. sure. For To, to yeah. unlearn the things that we are taught to find truth is one yeah. of the hardest things yeah. we can challenge ourselves to do. But it's also one of the most like inspiring and beautiful things like watching your mother grow every time we come back and see her and check in and like mm -hmm. and, and and like be there with her during that was like it was fascinating to be like wow like she's coming like she's coming to life mm -hmm. that it felt like she was coming yeah. to life and you never really thought she wasn't in life before but she, now yeah. she just became present yeah. in present right. to life. You know, it was, mm -hmm. it was fascinating. It was really beautiful. Mm -hmm. Cause you only knew her as she was. And then you got to know her as she became more and more true to who she is when she was in her sovereignty. And that, you know, it's uh, thank you for sharing that story, love. It's mm -hmm. so, that's so beautiful. It's, it's exactly that life brings us these catalysts, like these ruptures that, you know, in, at the time might seem impossible I have a client who for uh, was married for 24 years, Australian. Her husband was amazing. I remember when I first met her, all she did was talk about her husband and her family and her kids, and they had the most beautiful marriage. And he and he got a, a cancer with he didn't know the source of the cancer. They didn't know the source of the cancer, and after about a year, a year and a bit, he passed away. And she walked through that with him, and she. Mm -hmm. Um, and she at the time was like, I'll never love again. And, you know, it was a massive catalyst into her life's mm -hmm. purpose. She's now a grief coach for women, helping liberate themselves around rewriting their story. Of course, would she change it and have her husband back? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And that was his sole path. And hers is now going in a different direction. And life, just like you said earlier, the universe, life mm -hmm. is always bringing us these catalysts to change the course of our direction based on where we're meant to go next and what our evolution mm -hmm. is meant to be. And I'm so happy to hear that that was your mom's experience because some women completely just spiral down mm -hmm. and men when they, when a relationship ends or when they lose someone they love or when an unexpected change happens, so many people completely lose themselves even further. Mm -hmm. And it, yet it's such a potent catalytic time. I actually do a workshop called Aligned Closure that's specifically for um, women going through divorce because 90% mm -hmm. of the women I end up working with are women who have checked all the boxes, followed the rules perfectly, you know, still in the modern world in 2023, still there's this, you know, pressure to have one partner and one partner for life. And if you end a relationship, you better be looking for one next. There's this collective mm -hmm. discomfort with women being single. And, you know, I think even having a label for it, it's like, why, why is my relationship status determined? Like, why do I even need a label? Why mm -hmm. can't I just be me in a relationship and me on my own? Right. And, yeah. and there's, 
still so much, there's still so much old thinking, old paradigm thinking around mm-hmm. relationships and love in the modern world and life. And, you know, the scripted life is checking the boxes and doing it perfectly. And I work with women who do the script very perfectly. And then they wake up one day completely empty inside or depressed or miserable or anxious or you know, lost or Mm. codependent or whatever. And they, they don't know who they are. And you hear people will say all the time, I lost myself in that Mm. relationship. Mm. And it's because they were never anchored in themselves. Because when you're really anchored relationships, you know, they're, they're a compliment to your life, but they're not everything. You're not lost without them. You can stand on your own two feet and you can stand, you know, Mm. next to your partner and, and, And so that's the journey of the unscripted woman is like learning how to untether from who I've been taught to be so I can actually get to know Mm -hmm. my own soul like your mom did. And it's funny you said it was her reclamation because my one of my programs is called my virtual coaching programs called the reclamation. Oh, wow. I need to tell my mom about these programs. I think she... Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds like she's doing pretty good. No, I mean, Well, she can always, you know... She can enhance. You can always enhance of it. Course. And I think with the this path and this healing journey, I, you know, I watch my mom from the distance. She goes through yeah. waves, Cyclical, right? Cyclical, for Cyclical, sure. I think. And, and, you know, at times I'm like, I don't know if she'll ever heal that wound of what she's been through. Um, but at the same time, you know, it, like we said earlier, it's helped her grow, but it'll constantly be a little bit of that, that roller coaster. There are days when, you know, more sadness comes in or, but there are days when she feels more empowered and powerful. So it's constantly like riding that wave. And, you know, maybe it takes, I don't know, a certain amount of time for it to be okay. Maybe it never does for some people. Maybe it's a lot shorter for others. You know, like I think maybe it's a very, very personal Mm -hmm. experience that you can't really say one thing will fit everybody. But um, the fact that, you know, there are ways for women to, one, not feel alone. I think that's also another beautiful thing. Like, you know, having workshops and courses like this that you offer to women is really important because it's really easy to fall into that depression and that feeling like, well, now I don't have this partner. I don't have this life. I'm by myself. You feel lonely. You feel helpless. You don't know how to get back on your feet again. And I think that's probably the very first step is learning how do I, where's that power in me and how do I pull it into myself? I mean, you're, you being in the position you are, Kate, what is the first step usually for people that are recognizing they need to they need to find themselves once again and cont- yes. I like how you said the writing of the story like because yes our yeah. story is never done mm-hmm. we can always rewrite it in any direction I think that's the most fascinating thing about life that's never taught so when someone yes. recognizes they need that like what do you think the first step is uh I mean I think that just like Juliana said, it's going to be different for everyone, but essentials are you need a support system, but a healthy one. And Mm -hmm. most of us are surrounded by, you know, I, in my work, I call it your saboteur, but like uh, other people in their patterns, right? So who are Mm -hmm. just going to keep you in the victim mentality, or you should be in a relationship. We got to, you know, Mm -hmm. get you on Bumble and on Tinder out there to fill this void. So you don't feel the pain that you're feeling instead of them learning how to be with their feelings and how to um, how to be with what life brings and how, like it, it's, so it's about a, a support system is everything, but the right support system mm-hmm. in my online program, actually COVID was a, a, for many reasons, a really big gift for me in my life. And, uh, I, I remember when it first happened, I was like, okay, I, cause this is how I live trusting that even when things are scary and and painful and you don't know why or what's going on. There's something in this for me. There's a gift in this for me. And I knew it. And three months in, I, prior to COVID, my business was a hundred percent live. I did talks Mm. around North America. I even did a one in Australia. I would go wherever my clients were and they'd gather their friends. And, and I did, um, so live talks, live weekends, retreats, everything was live. And so I got, um, after at three months into COVID, it was like, okay, I guess I have to get a job. Like, what, what am I going to do? I don't know where to go from here. And my friend who's a marketer was like, you need to create, create a masterclass. And I'm like, what's a masterclass? And then she helped me create a masterclass. And then I created this online program called The Reclamation. And in the process of 
creating the program, the reclamation, I, it was more of a compliment to my live experiences mm-hmm. when they were going to be up and running again and to ha- help women have sort of a, a deeper, like be able to go through it at home and then come to the retreat or go through it after uh, was my original intention or for women who didn't, it wasn't in their means to be able to come travel to Greece and they would do it online. So that was my original intention, but never in a million years did I fathom that that true, deep, unbelievable sisterhood could be created in an online forum. Mm. Uh, this happens at my retreats where women are sisters for life. It's because they're going so deep into their pain, their vulnerability, they're sharing their hearts, they're loving each other through it. They're sharing their wildly expressed selves. They're, 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 they're in the range of playing with all parts of themselves and being loved and held in it at the retreats. Deep sisterhood comes from that and That's relationships beautiful. for life. And, but on the online program, I didn't think that was pop. Like I've never built deep relationships with people on zoom like ever. <laughs> I'm in an online program right now. And I'm like, yeah, I like you guys, but like, I feel like I don't know. I just, and yet, and it's not even zoom. They get one zoom call at the beginning, one at the end. And it's like Facebook lives with me, but inside of the sisterhood, I suggested one day, one of you do a video and share, like, if you feel comfortable, share, use it as an opportunity to grow, share a video, Mm -hmm. sharing your updates as you're going on the journey. And that became a trend. And now the Facebook group, there's right now about a hundred women in it Mm -hmm. and the fate, and it keeps growing. I I've done about five rounds at this time. And in the Facebook group is, um, so active. And so the women are so supportive and they're, they're, traveling across the world to meet each other. They're going on trips together. Like the sisterhood is insane. And I was in Vancouver in January and I hosted a weekend and um, women came from 12 different states and from from Canada too. And and they they felt like they knew each other and they had just met on Zoom. So sisterhood is absolutely everything, but it's not just friendship. You know, it's Mm. not your friends that keep you stuck where you are. It's, it's friends, it's sisterhood, women that can, and, and men, but they can hold you to your highest, that mm-hmm. see you for all of who you are, that love you in your darkness and your vulnerability and that mm-hmm. inspire you to be more than you think you are and That's support amazing. you. You know, it's yeah. the full range. That, that part is everything. Wow. And I think also what's really powerful about that is that these support groups are of women that have gone through something similar obviously yeah. different. It's everybody's personal experience, but there is like... Well, they're in the same place. They're in the same or place, place or they're healing in a similar place. So it's like there's a, a deeper bond, I think, that you know people can form yes. as well because they're helping one another through, right? It's inspiring yeah. each other and through. And inspiring through it because you see another, yes. another woman going through it and finding some progress and it inspires you to continue to do that work. So it's, exactly. it's group therapy really like in, well, in that sense, but in, but in a, in a way, way, I think mm-hmm. true friendship, like true valuable friendship, it, it's group therapy too, yeah. because it's yeah. just what are the yeah. common denominators that keep your friendship there, right? And if if you have a friendship with somebody where the common denominator is support and in like true support, like you were saying, of like the true authentic self and and inspiration yeah. and mm-hmm. and watching them succeed and being actually happy for them, yeah. or watching you succeed and feeling their love in return, yeah. um, like those kinds mm-hmm. of things, like that is to me like relationships greatest core like those kinds of qualities and I think in this day and age we've been maybe it's something we have to unlearn or be a little bit more uh, use more discernment around but you know we choose a lot of our friends and throughout our life from circumstance or from things that don't feed our soul or sometimes it's people that justify keeping us in a victim mentality or keeping us in a space that we feel like we need Mm -hmm. to be in order to to be content in our own misery and I think like I mean the biggest shift in my life was allowing people to fall away from my Rolodex or top 10 friends that I call on my like last 10 people that text messaged me and things like that, that weren't actually like, they were uh, like, it's funny. I don't want to say they weren't actually friends because we had relationship, but it was a different type of relationship. It wasn't a true friendship. Mm -hmm. And, and I think you like, 
it's hard to realize that like, wow, we're a little, I was a little lonelier than I thought. And I, re, you know, all of a sudden you realize your, your friends all wanted something from you or it was like based on going to a bar or some kind of like toxic element or gossip or whatever it might be. There's so many reasons you can bond with people that don't feed your soul. But when you start finding those people and a, a, I, I, don't, I don't know if I like even calling what you're saying this group a support group because it's just people that are feeding each other's fire. Like that's... That's, yeah. And that's and, true friendship. And, the, and, and that helps well. heal. Because yeah. like community, true community mm -hmm. is the healing ingredient. Like yeah. that is, and whether it's a small community, just like a family, like mm -hmm. you and me and Xavier, or whether it's a group of a crazy to say this, because I would have never thought it either until I've, you know, experienced the power of online authenticity. But whether it's yeah. a group of a hundred people on a Facebook group, like you can find yes. that it's there. And, and when you find it, it's, I don't know. I guess now in life that we've come to a point where we understand the value of it, it's, it's the most precious thing as far as a relationship goes because it allows you the space yes. to be who you are. Mm -hmm. And that we all, you know, to be who you are, that's, you know, like I love how you said that at the beginning, to be who you are, that's the beginning of everything. You can't have a good relationship, which, relationship with anyone if you're not who you truly are in your authentic yeah. self. Yeah, and I mean, and you see it a lot of the times that certain relationships force you to become something that you're not true. Like you almost like you, you morph yourself to be liked by the other person. And I find, I mean, maybe you can speak to this better, but you know, when you continue to live in that way, you're slowly f taking yourself further away from your truth, you know, in that type mm -hmm. of relationship. And that turns it into a toxic relationship. Yeah. Is there um, like in your work that you do with women, do you see that a lot as well? Okay. Yeah, so I teach the in my the master class that was the yeah. first thing that was born from COVID. I teach the five uh, saboteur archetypes that I just noticed mm -hmm. over the years of coaching. There were the same consistent ways that women were um, selling themselves out to get love, and we do it in all our relationships at work mm -hmm. and with friendships, with family, with romantic relationships, especially. Right. Um, but the saboteur archetypes, the first one, well, the one you just mentioned was the shapeshifter. Mm -hmm. So the shapeshifter is I need to change who I am so that you accept me. And it's it's also like under an assumption that we think the person needs us to be this person so that they like us. But and we learn all of these our, all of these aspects of ourselves that we pick them up when we're little because when we're little kids we're wildly expressed, we're free, we're I mean you see it with Xavier and mm -hmm. he's his soul self yeah. fully vulnerable when he needs to be. He cries, he screams, he lets it out. He hmm. says no when it's no. Hmm. He says yes when it's a yes. He is geared towards lightness and pleasure, but he's not afraid to feel pain. Like he just, it, it, we are wildly expressed as children, every single one of us. And then we get shut down over and over a million times over many millions of times. We get shut down everywhere in our families, in our school system, the school system, especially. I mean, I just think of the repression that happens in the school system. It breaks my heart thinking of how these wild little, you know, creatures get put into this cement building and they have to sit still and they can't talk unless being spoken to and they get X's on their pages and told they're either good or bad or huh. right or wrong. And, like this is the program that starts the saboteur. And so of course, little kids learn how to shape shift, right? Who do I need to be with this person? Oh, my teacher's really mean. I need to be like quiet and small. Oh, this person's really um, quiet. So I need to take up space like, or I, no one's giving me attention. So I need to be loud and talk a lot. Like we, we adapt to whatever environment we're in. And um, so that's where the shapeshifter archetype gets wow. learned. They all do when we're kids. But um, so, of course, that shows up in romantic relationships mm. with women a lot where they either become their partner mm. or they become who they think they need to be so that they're loved or liked by that person mm. or chosen by that person. And then later the shapeshifter always says, I lost myself in relationship, but but that's what I was saying earlier. Like you, you don't, didn't know yourself to begin with, because if you were anchored in yourself, you wouldn't like, you might have a moment where you want to shape shift, but then you'd be like, wait, that actually doesn't feel true for me. Right. But if you're not anchored in truth, which huh. mm -hmm. you, is important to you guys too, true, your, our truth. Yeah. Like if you don't know your truth, then you'll never be able to operate in your relationships from that place. Mm. So, and then the fantasy addict is one, which is, like the fantasy of life, who I'm supposed to be, what my life's supposed to look like. 
Right. And it's all a performance for the fantasy addict, which most people are living their life like that. Like my life looks good on Instagram. This is the women I work with. It looks good on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Everyone's approved of it. My house is beautiful. My car is beautiful. My hair is beautiful. My face is beautiful. I like all, they've got this external persona Mm -hmm. and I'm successful. I'm this, I'm that. But like on the inside, they're empty or they're unhappy because it's all for everybody else. That's the fantasy addict, Mm -hmm. the fantasy of what my life's supposed to look like or what I'm supposed to look like or what my relationship's supposed right. to look like, what the man is supposed to look like. Mm. Um, that, so that's a fantasy. Does that include like putting on a face in front of other people, not just the like the visual of it, like actually acting the role when the truth is un- underneath? Yeah. yeah. Cause I, I've seen a lot of, I, I mean, I think I've probably played that archetype out before in my life where you pretend yes. that things are good and that you're happy and that yeah, everything's fine. That's yeah. And true. smile when you're the smiling, when you're not happy, yeah. you know, like the yes. playing yeah. it. I think that's a fascinating thing. And I think it's like, it's like, it, it's that I, it, the archetyped idea of like the role, you know, like to walk into yeah. a store and play the role of a customer, to talk to a police yes. officer and play the role of a citizen mm-hmm. or a subordinate or, you know, yeah. to like the, the role playing of the identities mm-hmm. that we do from circumstance to circumstance in life. I think it's such a fascinating thing. It really is. And yeah. I also feel like at some point in our life, it's going to slap us in the face too. Like even when you're talking it about does. this fantasy, yeah. uh, what, what do you call it again? Sorry, the fantasy. The fantasy addict. The fantasy yeah. addict, right? It's like you're so concerned with the material external view of yourself that at some point what's in here is going to feel empty. And then you're going to, you know what I mean? Then you're going to keep looking for the external part and it's not going to fill you in that same way anymore. Like you can't live in fantasy for the rest of your life. At some point, reality is going to set in. And whether that is a shift in the fantasy, like if somebody is concerned so much about, I look perfect all the time, my hair looks perfect. And then something happens and, you know. Well, there's there's the the cliche character of the, old lady like the old Hollywood lady that's like still believing she's in her 20s and acting like in that grandiose sort of like you know so it maybe it it doesn't break at some point but it must be torturous to live inside of a archetype for a lifelong thing like there's there's some very little authenticity in that that's so interesting and do you have like clients that have come from that particular archetype that you work with Oh yeah. Fa- yeah. Fantasy. I mean, really most women, especially when they do the masterclass, they're like, um, I think I'm all of them. And uh, with shame, they say that. And it's, that's totally normal. Mm-hmm. It's like, we're going to dance between all of them for sure. But fantasy, I mean, when it comes to love and when it comes to our conditioning around beauty, around mm-hmm. what our lives are supposed to mm-hmm. look like, that's the program. We're fed that message every oh. minute of every day, especially now that we have social media. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Like we are fed. People are looking at relationships and oh, I wish I had that. And you're looking at a picture. That's not their relationship. You don't know what their relationship <laughs> oh is. You might, be wishing, you might be wishing to be a, with a narcissist in captivity. Like you actually don't know what's happening behind closed doors. And then we com- the fantasy addict is the, is the part that compares ourselves to other people and thinks we need to be like them as opposed to be who we are. Mm-hmm. And the only reason we would ever, I used to be riddled with comparison. And the only reason I ever did it is because I didn't know my own soul. But it mm-hmm. totally went away when I learned how to, live from my own soul. And now Mm. I just appreciate, you know, women that are powerful or up to cool things or whereas before it used to make me smaller because I was in the fantasy of like, oh, they have something I can't have. But actually what it is, is a reflection of where you're headed or what part of yourself, your soul is calling Mm. uh, to step into. But like all our messaging around love is so fantasy based. It's insane. And a lot of it's toxic, you know, like intense passion, chemistry, you know, hate you, love you, hate you, love you. And like that. Yeah. And then a lot of women end up going down that rabbit hole. And it's like, we've been fed that that's romantic and that's actually toxic relational yeah. dynamic. Like, yeah. That's so like, there's just fantasy is everywhere. Yeah. What, what are everywhere. the, what is the third Ar- This is so fascinating. These architects. <laughs> <laughs> the third, yeah, they're fun. The third is the self-sacrificer, which is a very common one for women. Some men have it, but I would say it's the majority of women on planet mm-hmm. earth have it because it's been, um, you know, it's been in our, um, it's been in our programming as women for centuries. And obviously we've, we've moved to a lot of places in the Western world in terms of patriarchy and breaking free from women 
doing everything and but even even still this the it still lives inside of women so the mm. the idea that they have to sacrifice themselves for other people is like that and it, it's it shows up with the women i work with it and this used to be me as well they they cannot make a decision for themselves because they're so concerned about everyone else's experience mm-hmm. and they they don't even consider their own. Mm-hmm. Well, I can't say no to that person because what about this and this right. and this or I have to do this thing because I I might let them down and so their their whole life and it's glorified, right? Yeah. To be selfless. Like how many of how many times have you heard a woman be glorified for her selflessness? She's less mm-hmm. of a self. Oh, my grandmother was so selfless, yeah. but she didn't have a self. <laughs> and men are taught to be selfish. Like you become something, you make something of yourself. Right, right. And and women are taught to be selfless and make sure nobody's feelings get hurt and make sure everybody, you know, is included. And and so the self-sacrificer often, especially fantasy addict self-sacrificer, that's the archetype that ends up in really toxic relational mm-hmm. dynamics because the fantasy addict is ignoring all the red flags and all the gut feelings mm-hmm. that they're feeling when something's off. And the self-sacrificer is the one who's like, it's okay. I see his soul. (laughs) It's a project relation. You know, like I'm, I'm going to make it better or whatever. They're sacrificing their own well-being for someone else. Or it happens, of course, in friendships and Mm -hmm. at work and everywhere. Do you think that also falls into people that are, you know, I, I, I have some girlfriends that sometimes are like, well, they want to heal that person. Like they get into a relationship almost like because there's this deep desire to heal the other person. Yes. Yeah. That's a wound mate, <laughs> wound mate relationship. Wound mate. That's the self, mm. And that's the self-sacrificer, mm. right? It's like a wounded child part of themselves. Right. And, and I want to heal you. Like there's also a, a power imbalance in that. Mm. It's like, oh, if I can, I can help you. I can heal you. First of all, it'll never happen. Second of all, to create, if it, if it did, it would be now you're the healer and they're not that not that healers are above, but it does create a power imbalance because it's not your job. Mm-hmm. You know, love can be healing for sure, but it, it's healing when two people are sovereign and take mm. responsibility for themselves. Right. And, you know, and then can from that place have open, honest, vulnerable, real conversations and speak truths and, mm-hmm. you know, all of the things that make healthy relationships. Mm-hmm. That's so beautiful. Mm-hmm. <laughs> no, it's, and you see it a lot, right? And I think the, that healing Sorry, say that again. The healing what? The healing? The wound mate relationship? The wound mate relationship, yeah. I've seen the play out of these wound mate relationship um, from the mm-hmm. outside. Mm-hmm. And it always, I find, comes from that idea of if I heal the other person, they're going to love me more. I'm going to deepen right. the love because I'm the one that came and rescued them. It's like almost wanting yeah. to be the hero of that yeah. story. But what yeah. you're saying is so true. Like you can't... Like, of course, you can help the other person through love and through just partnership and through support. But true healing, if there's a deeper wound, if it's trauma or whatever it is in that other human yeah. being, like you're saying, I don't, you know, it, it has to come from them. That You know, you can't force yeah. that healing because, I mean, you could even cause more damage in the relationship. That's just my, my perspective mm-hmm. on it. But, um, but you know. For but, sure. And that's, mm-hmm. that's the fantasy. That's the mm-hmm. veil, right? It's the right. delusion. It's like what we tell ourselves to stay in situations that are actually stopping us from being all of who we are. Mm-hmm. And we don't know. Like this is just our conditioning around love. We don't, yes. women don't know. I mean, the, whenever I do the masterclass, it's, it is, I mean, they love it because it's, it, you don't know what you don't know until you know. And right. then once you know, it's like, holy shit, this ar- these archetypes are playing out in every facet of my life. Mm. And, you know, it's robbing you really because it's robbing you from real love and it's robbing you from experiencing your life. If I'm out there sacrificing myself, chances are I'm really tired on the inside. You know, if I'm out there mm. and or pissed off or resentful or whatever, like that comes at a cost. If, I, if I'm pretending to live live my fantasy life and trying to be perfect on the outside, guarantee I don't feel good on the inside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, and so like these all of, and shape-shifting, it's like if my, if you loving me is determined, is, is dictated by who I need to be so you love me, well, then I'll never feel loved. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Right. I'll never actually feel loved because it's not really me. Mm -hmm. So it's like, and then later we're like, why don't you love me? And it's like twisting myself more. And Mm -hmm. it's because you're not being you. So you can't feel the love. Mm -hmm. That's Mm -hmm. fascinating. My goodness. What's what's number four? This is great. (laughs) (laughs) 
I love that you're twiddling your thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. Um, number four is the controller. Okay. And this is this is the most common archetype I work with. Mm. They're all a hybrid of of different ones, but the controller is the primary. And the controller, a lot of controller fantasy addicts, but the controller is the woman who. Uh, I mean, it can look many different ways because there's hybrids, right? So a controller shapeshifter self-sacrificer would be more a softer controller, but right. a controller, uh, Miranda Priestley from The Devil Wears Prada is an example of the mm. controller. Mm. Um, controllers are power. Typically, the, the, sh- the light side of the controller is really powerful and successful and mm-hmm. ambitious and, and uh, often very guarded from love. Sometimes it's like, oh, I don't need a man or I don't need a relationship. Mm. I don't need love. I don't have time for that. You know, there's all the defense. But if you're, it's not about the relationship, whether you're in one or not, if you're in that stance, your heart is shut down. So you're, you, you might be, it's not about whether you have a relationship, but you're missing parts of yourself. Right. You're missing out on experiencing some of the beauty and magic, a huge part of the beauty and magic of who you are. Mm-hmm. And so I, they're actually really fun to work with for me, especially when they come to the immersion, my retreat in Corfu, which mm-hmm. I have next week, because it's so so sweet to see a controller on the other side when she's dropped into her heart. I actually, mm-hmm. our podcast, um, I recorded an episode with one of my clients very recently and she shared her story of coming on the journey and going from being the check all the boxes, do it perfectly. So that's a controller mixed with a fantasy addict mm-hmm. because the controller is controlling life because underneath they actually don't feel safe in the world. Typically it comes from not feeling safe as a child, having you know maybe a lot of chaos or trauma at home. And so there's this feeling like I have to, perfectionism is Mm -hmm. a piece of it. I have to control everything around me or everyone around me so that I stay safe. Mm -hmm. Typically, they don't trust that other people can support them or other people Mm -hmm. have got it. So they take on too much. Um, There's this sense of like, there's this like hardness Mm -hmm. because deep down they don't feel safe. And so they're trying to get safety from um, controlling everything. But again, self-fulfilling prophecy, they'll never feel safe because the external world and other people are out of our control. Like right. never, ever, ever will it be in our control but go the way you think it's supposed to go. So then it keeps perpetuating that you're not safe. Huh. Mm. Wow. <laughs> That's, it's funny because like you apply these archetypes in your work to women and yeah. relationships and that kind of thing. And coming at this, just listening from a man's point of view, like it's so human at the same time. Like these archetypes, yeah, oh, I, of course. Yeah. I can place these on top of so many different people, whether man or woman or mm-hmm. it, like, it's, it's fascinating. And it's, yeah. and, and yeah. I can place it upon myself in all kinds mm-hmm. of different stages of my life. I'm like, For oh, sure. yeah. mm-hmm. And also currently being like, oh, I should really work on that. Like to be a little <laughs> self-aware as you're saying that. Yeah. I'm like, hmm, yes. that's yeah. a, that's a, I think I need to hear that today. You know, that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Wow. And there's, so there's two more archetypes, right? No, no, no. There's That's, five. There's five. The shape-shifter. We started oh, at the last oh, okay. one. We started at the last one. Okay. And so, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Wow. So yeah. was That's that the it. fifth one or was that it was the fourth the one. one? I thought that was the fourth one. That was the fifth one. It was, but we started with the fifth one, which is the shapeshifter. Oh. And fantasy addict. That's, I mean, in my mind, maybe yeah. it can be any order, but I always teach them in that order. <laughs> right. But we started, Juliana said, uh, shared something that was a shapeshifter example. Yeah. So that's where we started there. <laughs> and my question is, so you have all these women that come with specific check boxes, I would say that they fit maybe a little bit more into this archetype or this archetype. Is there something like when you do your master classes or, you know, your, your retreats with these women, is there something that you find is the first groundbreaking practice or step that you have to take that applies to all archetypes to kind of get them out of that or help that awareness and understanding? Yeah, it's actually, so this is the coolest part about the work is you name your saboteur and there's only one name. There's different Mm -hmm. aspects to her, but she has one name. And then you name what I call your heroine, which is the unscripted woman. You're becoming the heroine of your own story. Mm -hmm. And so um, in that process, it's so profound what happens for women because we're so identified with who we think we are based Mm -hmm. on our name. Our name is so, I, um, our saboteur patterns are so inter, intertangled with who we think we are right. and our names mm. associated with that. So when you start to, so the first step is to get to know the saboteur. That's the first step. Mm. And it's like getting really intimate with understanding 
her like she's not you because she's not. It's your mm-hmm. conditioned self. It's your false identity you created to survive when you're a child. Mm-hmm. And you keep her going thinking, oh, this is my personality. I'm a perfectionist. I'm an introvert hiding from the world. I'm mm-hmm. this, I'm that. But it's like all of these are, are ways that we learn to adapt based on our environment. It's not your soul. None of it's your soul. Mm-hmm. And so when you start to untether and you get to know your saboteur and you give her a name, mine's Regina, like Regina George from Mean Girls. Because she used to be so, when I first named her, she used to be so mean to me. Mm -hmm. And it shifts over time when you start to build a relationship with this part of you. And it's not about, you know, killing her off or sticking her in the trunk. It's about really building a relationship with this part and getting to know her like she's your roommate. She's Mm -hmm. renting out the penthouse suite. She's not you, but she's she's occupying your mind like most of your thoughts and the stories that you believe and make up about yourself and the world around you is your Mm -hmm. saboteur and so and your behaviors and how she's having you operate through all these different archetypes so the first step is to name that part of you and get intimate with her like get to know and observe these patterns and how they're showing up Mm -hmm. and then they name their heroine and and in the um, experience the immersion in Greece it's so cool they go by their heroine name for a whole week So now they're no longer identifying with their name. They actually get to feel like, okay, so if I'm not that, who am I? And there's just this blank canvas. Mm. It's so, it's really profound. What's what's your heroine name? Oh, well, that's kind of a long story, but I'll tell you the short (laughs) version. Um, I'll tell you a really condensed version of it. My legal birth name is Andrea Kathleen Irwin. So Kate Harlow is actually my heroine name. And I was on this journey The first probably like eight years of my growth without knowing it, Mm -hmm. um, I was becoming my heroine without knowing that this was going to be a body of work I would one day Mm -hmm. teach and and download or whatever you want to call it. Um, And so Kate is my, comes from my middle name and I changed my name when I was 25 and that was the first step. And I was actually Katie at first. And then I went to Mm -hmm. Kate once I started feeling like people weren't taking me seriously as Katie and I was kind of evolving from girl to woman. Mm I made into to mother or goddess. Um, and so Kate was the first iteration. And then a year before I launched my own business, I was coaching for a company for about nine years. And when I launched my own business, um, I, a year before I was like, I'm going to be known one day. I I want, um, I need a better name than Kate Irwin. And um, I kind of just said it as a joke, but then I had a bath that night and I heard Harlow, which is my great grandfather's name. And I studied my genealogy in one of my counselor's training programs back in the day. And that was my great grandfather's middle name, Herbert Harlow. And he was a preacher and I'm totally a preacher. (laughs) And he was a bright light. He was Australian, um, lived in LA or Australia, Sydney, and then LA, um, in the forties and, and moved the family eventually to Canada. And he, I just heard so many amazing stories about him. So it felt really symbolic. And Mm -hmm. so Kate Harlow, so I spent a year getting to know Kate Harlow. Who is Kate Harlow? How is she different than Kate Irwin? Like, Mm -hmm. who is she? How does she show up in the world? And, uh, and then one day my mentor was introducing me on stage and this is when I was still working with this other company. And she, I said, you wanted me to introduce you as Kate Harlow. All my friends knew I was kind of getting to know this new part of myself. And she did. And that week, so many people came up to me and they were like, wow, you have the coolest name. <laughs> and it was my first time going by wow. it. So, yeah. So I, 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 and when you ask that, I'm like, gosh, I'm kind of play with, I did have another heroine name later. Cause it's like, there's, a, it's always nice to have that sort of Clark Kent Superman, like another mm-hmm. name that you yeah, can yeah, pull yeah. on. Wow. And now that I'm in, now that I am Kate Harlow and I fully embodied her, there probably is a next level, but, um, or there, of course there is a next level, but yeah, Kate Harlow is my heroine. That's wow, amazing. You truly are, are living your heroine self <laughs> I, now. That's, I yeah. love that. I love that so much. Wow. wow. That's such a cool story. I love it. I, I like the connection to where Harlow came from too, the origin story there. Yeah. That's like, that's really I beautiful. don't know. We were talking about that yesterday, just the connections to like family, like to mm-hmm. like old yeah. family and, and how we were thinking about a lot about like how far we know our family mm-hmm. back, but also like to how to honor them, um, how to honor them more and, yes. and, and, mm-hmm. and how to try to seek more information about them. I think is also, it's tricky because obviously we live in a digital age versus not even an analog age, like two generations ago, like a paper yeah. age. So it's like, I don't even know how right. to research that kind of stuff, mm-hmm. but it's to, to adopt that. It's such a beautiful it's thing. so beautiful. Wow. Thank amazing, goodness. Kate. Well, it's been an amazing hour to spend and then just chat and connect with you. And I think for people 
that are listening right now, I'm sure this has connected to a lot of oh. women and I can't wait to share a lot, like a lot of your workshops and, and uh, classes with my mom because I, I do believe that she will probably benefit. Let's send this. her to Greece. I will send her to Greece <laughs> to meet you. Uh, <laughs> um, there's actually one spot left. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Look at that. Yeah, it's maybe. amazing. But uh, maybe, you know, how can people find you? How can they learn more about your master classes, your retreats? How can they connect with you? Thank you, love. Mm -hmm. uh, and thank you so much for having me. This is so fun. So fun. Yeah. Um, I'm just, yeah, love. I, 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 this is actually before I tell you where to find me, I just want to say like, um, I feel like aligned relationships and like we talked about sisterhood, but connections and relationships, it's soulmates. And really mm -hmm. like when we're in alignment with our souls, we're really mates to every, you know, like all souls, yeah. but not everyone's mm -hmm. living in their souls. Most people aren't. And so when you find like, that's how I felt the first night I met you guys, mm -hmm. it just felt like, oh yeah, this mm -hmm. like soul totally. yeah. alignment, like totally. see the world in the same way, you yeah. know, same values, um, living the unscripted life. And I'm just, yeah, so happy mm -hmm. to be here with you and oh honored God. and just love you both so much. Yes. You're just radiant <laughs> beings in the world. <laughs> Well, we share the love back. Oh my know. God. And the feeling of like, yes. when I, that's interesting. I've never thought of it that way. But the when you're living in that authentic self and yeah. the soul and mm -hmm. recognizes yeah. other souls like that. And yes. the first time we met, yeah, I was just like, just she's met. awesome. Yeah. This is amazing. And the, you know what I mean? And then, we and then we didn't see you for a while. And like when we saw you during COVID in Vancouver, it was just like we didn't miss a beat. And then yeah. even today, it's like, we haven't Let's missed a beat. Yeah. Like it's, it's such amazing. a time and space don't matter when it's like when the syncopation is there. It's really beautiful. Yes. My goodness. Totally. So yeah, That's right. That's soul. And so we have soulmates everywhere. So about the fantasy love, there's not just one. Yes. <laughs> soulmates everywhere. Yes. When you're living in alignment with your soul. Mm -hmm. And um, my my Instagram, you can look up Kate Harlow or the unscripted woman with no E. So mm -hmm. it's unscripted. Um, and my website is the unscriptedwoman.com. You can spell it either way and it'll come up. Amazing. But um, yeah, thank you so much no, for thank having you me. for oh my goodness, for yeah. this beautiful hour. I mean, this has been so enlightening, and it's really beautiful to to dive into these topics and these aspects of ourselves of of learning how to clean all this stuff, you know, that society yeah. puts on us that, so you know, and, it's, and it's dig deep into our souls. An exercise in self-awareness. Exactly. Which yeah. is the key to everything, it to really know is. yourself, yeah. know thyself. That's where it starts. Yeah. And I think like just the value of this hour alone is just like, wow. Yeah. Like, it's like, I'm going to contemplate on this for a few days for sure. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. It. Yeah. Uh, amazing. I love that. I, I love watching your reaction because it's, I teach this to women all day long, every day. And men are always like, what about us? What about us? And it's so sweet <laughs> to be like, oh yeah, it does resonate for men. I'm so sure. Cool. For sure. Oh my God. It goes both ways for That's sure. That's so cool. Amazing. Well, thank you, Kate, so much. <laughs>